Welcome to the Go Big Redcast, the Husker Fan Sports Show. Welcome to the Go Big Redcast. I'm your host, Honky, and uh, this is Matt's Rule. I'm with Mac. Yeah, it's Matt's Rule. It's a, it, it, last few weeks, we decided it was just enough to make Matt's Rule. And, and here we are. We got spring game news. We got announcements about former coaches coming back that we're going to celebrate. It's a bunch going on right now. So we're just going to kind of kick back tonight, have a little Matt's Rule. We're going to Kind of chew the fat about what we've been hearing from press conferences, practice videos, sights and sounds, stuff like that. If you guys have any questions out there you want to talk about, depth chart stuff, or, you know, nobody knows shit. So we can all pretend to be geniuses right now. Just like we're in the honeymoon phase of the rule period, we are in the honeymoon phase of a podcast world right now because we're winning everything right now. Yeah. And we had a big recruiting weekend we got to talk about too a little bit. Yeah. Because you can't have a podcast about Nebraska football without having – a Riola in your thumbnail. <laughs> <That's not going laughs> we'll do that. Uh, for the, the people that are already watching us live, uh, send us a comment if everything sounds good to you. Um, I much prefer this over Fra- Scott Frost. <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah, just send us a comment real quick if everything sounds good because we are literally in Mac's basement right now. We kind of threw this together last garage. second, as you would expect. Yeah. Uh, not, not basement, garage. Yeah. Um, actually, do you have the, the drink down there, man? I need to. I need to pour. Yeah, I don't think I did. It. I did. No, I put some in. Oh, did you already give me some? I did. I just didn't. Mm. Yeah. That's good. It's made with real cherry. <laughs> real cherry. <laughs> um, so, anyways, uh, we're going to talk about a couple things here. Trev was on the radio tonight, and uh, so we're going to get into yeah, the – want to go, like, newest to first? Well, we'll go through, like, what, what he talked about, Frank Solich, uh, sellout. Yeah. Uh, let's get that the game sold out, and that yeah. Solich is going to be there, which is awesome. Yep. Sounds good, boys. Thank you very much, Oscar. Awesome. Thank you. Um, uh, that there's a, a wait list, apparently, on the on ticket yeah. sales right now, which is awesome. Uh, there's also he, – he talked a little bit about um, uh, Big Ten ADs getting together, talking about uh, mm-hmm. future schedules. And then volleyball day, so that's cool. So we'll we'll do a little bit of that, okay. and I think we'll also touch on some of the the spring ball stuff that's going on, single digits and What's big recruiting time? weekend. So, yeah. Um, before we do that, let me just say say this: a couple of upcoming shows here, quick. Adam Carricker, Monday, April third at two p.m. Going to be a fan forum there with him. So that's a cool. That's going to be really cool. Throw the bones with them, and then on Wednesday, April twelfth at eight p.m., oh, nice. we'll have Brandon Cavanaugh. Husker college football analyst with Athlon Sports. Oh, cool. Cool. All right. Max. Nice work. Yes. Man, we throw this together really quick, but it, this is a lot of fun. And this is the match rules, just it's the laid back version of the Red Cast. Right. It's not nearly as much of the, the prep work, quite honestly. We, <laughs> but it, it's just us doing it. Might thing. be more of a tendency to ramble on this pod, which is fine. <laughs> Tony, I don't have my alarm shut off, so when you text me real time, I get it real time. <laughs> anyway, yeah, Bill says uh, Max sounds kind of nasally. Oh wait, that's his that's normal just, voice. That is my normal voice. Uh, Bill, just like I look angry all the time. That's just how I look. And Bill, I don't know if this looks familiar to you, but this is uh, from the the days. This is where you made Max uh, Brown or Blonde Moment Ale. Yeah. It's upside down how they they wrote well, that, but that's I think a joke. Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Well, the way he said it was so like, eh, it's upside down. It's kind of a Norm McDonald. Hey. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's st- let's start tonight. Do you want to start with Trev or do you want to start with, with spring football? Um, I mean, just since it, since it was so relevant and so new, I think it'd be interesting to talk about a couple of things, kind of giving credence to, you know, Nebraska's greatest resource, which is Nebraska fans. And um, sounds like from tonight um, – Trev announced that there's like 9,000 people on the waiting list for the spring – for not for spring game, but for uh, season tickets, which is a hell of a thing to hear. I was kind of surprised by that. I don't know how you feel about that. But 9,000 people off a team that had just won four games going through a coaching transition. I know there's a lot of hype around the program right now, but that just goes to show you what the hype is right now. That's huge. Yeah, I hadn't uh, I hadn't heard that because I, I didn't listen to all of Trev's thing tonight. I was doing some family stuff. And anyways – um, so I didn't get a chance to listen to all that. I was trying to follow through tweets and some of the big right. the big points. But that is huge. And mm-hmm. I brought this up a number of times before on the show where when you think about what Memorial Stadium is today versus 
1999 when we we're getting done with school and, and during yeah. our era um they've added a pinnacle bank arena to mm -hmm. memorial stadium so when someone oh, would sit yeah, there and say saying. oh my you know there's not as much interest in husker football look they can barely sell it out the sellout streak is is garbage that's bs mm -hmm. they they are they're selling out a different stadium today than the, what they had to sell out yeah, 20 sure. years ago when they were winning at that kind of clip and uh to to get anywhere i mean we're at a 90 you know upper 80s 90 000 seat stadium um, my argument is it's almost too big. Yeah, I, I would make an argument that Memorial Stadium, you could right size it. And I think that might be part of some of the future plans of what they'll do with like South Stadium is I, I could see a, a really sweet spot of 80 to 85 where you have a 10,000, you know, 15,000 backlog, kind of like what they used to have. And that's a healthy thing to have. I, I think I think that would be I think that'd be ideal. I think, you know, a lot of it is when when they built the stadium up, they were kind of chasing those numbers because there was such a demand for tickets. It made sense to add the seats at the time. I think it had been hard to project for people back in those days, just kind of how home theaters would improve so much. The home game experience would improve so much. The, uh, it just internet Wi-Fi, all the stuff that kind of takes the demand, takes uh, some of the game day experience away from the actual being at Memorial stadium. That's I think that's, if it's probably, if I understand it correctly, I've done exactly zero analysis on this <laughs> and I never will. Okay. <laughs> but I would imagine a lot of people are struggling with attendance and the, the numbers have gone down as, as, oh. the, as smartphones and everything else have gone up. So it makes sense to kind of bring the stadium back down to a, to a normal level. You want, you just want the energy, right? Like that's the main thing. Yeah. And and regardless though, I don't care what the if they don't take another seat, if we start winning games, that place will well, we haven't even won games yet. Exactly. And, and we're seeing this, that's right? I mean, you want the energy and you want the amenities. Those are kind of the two things that stadiums have to have now. And yeah. you know, I've mentioned uh, you know, last summer, Tyler Kai, great dude, you know, associate AD here. He he got me a, a, a tour of Tennessee Stadium right. and going through a lot built in the same era as Memorial Stadium, and they were going through a lot of the same kind of things that we're going through at Memorial Stadium. Mm -hmm. How do you re-envision pieces of areas of the of the stadium? And on the on the north side, up in their their balcony. They just took out two complete sections and put a jumbotron up there. And then in front of it have these like high top oh. tables that are intended for the ideal is maybe for younger people that to get lure them in where they can have drinks sure. and they can be standing up at, at high top tables. And the idea is they're not the people that have the money yet for the suites, but, right. but in 20 years they will. And this is a way to get them yep. into that stadium right now. Now in the process, that took Neyland Stadium from a hundred thousand seat stadium, and he and the guy that was giving us the tour, super cool dude, uh, Michael Wynn, I think, uh, remember his name, and and he was like, he was like, you know, we don't publish publicize this a lot, but this is going to probably take us under a hundred thousand some oh. of these updates because you know you're pulling out seats to add these amenities, sure. but those amenities are are wildly it has, you know popular. It it, it can't always be just about the number of seats, you know. It's like the quality of the game day experience has to be factored in these days. It's too competitive. Yeah. And and, and that's what makes Trev um, such a great AD is he understands that uh, there's there's holding on to tradition and then there's aggressively moving your program forward with, in the future that it's presented. Mm -hmm. And that's what Trev is doing. Same with NIL. Uh, same with all this stuff, you know, the the – the, the celebration of Title IX and doing the National yep. Volleyball. Day. Oh, like, my gosh. This, these are all aggressive moves by a, a, an a, a D who is like kind of a psychopathic competitor. <laughs> I, I, I love how you brought – like you mentioned like the, the, the Title IX, how he's presented that with the volleyball yeah. uh, day, how it's – He's done it for all the right reasons. Sure, sounds but, great. But it's really yeah. he's he's competitive and yeah. and it's almost like he's pissed oh, that, that we had the we no had question. we had the largest sellout you know or we had the largest attendance of any of any volleyball team or game in the in the country and then Wisconsin goes out and beats us by a couple hundred people and it's like are you kidding me we're gonna blow this out of the water yeah. and to hear Trev tell it it makes he makes it sound like. The Wisconsin AD kind of poked fun at him about not having that record anymore. And maybe that guy probably just said that in kind of a laugh, like, hey, we got it now. Good luck getting that. Mm -hmm. Thinking, no big deal. And then Tresmine just starts working up this thing. He's like, not only am I going to get that record, I'm going to blow it so far out of the water, they're not even going to bother. And uh, and they will. And that's great. And that's the guy who's at the top. And it seems like rules that kind of guy just all the way through. So, I mean, that's probably a good transition. I'm trying to think if there's anything else he said. To, well, 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 so, so the transition to me was you yeah. talked about how, how he's so good about getting us into the future. And that's, yes. that's dealing with, you know, NIL and, 
and, and the portal and just making sure that we're prepared as an athletic department to to take on all these modern day 2023 challenges. But before you can get to that, he also brings all the history of that comes with being a 1993 Butkus Award winner here and playing for Osborne. And it's it's more than just the roundtable discussion, which we've talked about a couple of times since the, that happened. Yeah. Um which was an unbelievable round table. If you haven't watched that Redcasters very, very on YouTube, good. absolutely Osborne great. Coach Osborne, Coach Rule, excellent. But so that's the future. Mm-hmm. The past is Coach Solich. Yeah. And we've talked about him in the past where it's almost like it's the curse of Solich. You know, like, you know, we got to bring him back, but you kind of say it joking. Well, tonight they, they made the announcement. Mm-hmm. They're bringing him back. And he also, he promised to make another announcement at the game concerning Solich. Um, as of now, I think they said it was about 52,000 seats sold for the game. We're still about a month away. I'm telling you, Redcasters, <laughs> call your call your parents, call your neighbors, call, you know, get your if you are a Redcaster from all across the country, make use this as a weekend to come back to Lincoln. Honestly, you got a, you got a week, a month to plan for it. Get back here. Let's sell severely, it severely this. Bums me out there. Let's sell this game out. Let's well, you've already bought, you but bought, I bought tickets, tickets, but you I bought, bought tickets. tickets, but I but I because of family obligations, um, cannot go. And it's not like a stupid wedding or anything like that. It's actually something fun. I was telling you all, you know, the last couple of weeks that, you know, let's sell it out for Coach Rule. And I still mean that. Let's sell it out for Coach Rule, the new staff. Uh, think of all the effort those they've done to go across the state and already kind of yeah. make connections yeah. to the state. Let's pay them back by by selling out the stadium. And, and I mean that. Now we have a second reason to do it. Let's absolutely have – Whatever the allowable amount of people in there can be, because I know that I think the well, east, yeah. the east balcony is going to be probably under construction. So, you, as with most spring games, a lot of times the stadium isn't yeah. 100% uh, capacity. But if it's 80,000, let's get 80,000 in there. And Coach Solich, mm-hmm. let's do it for him too. This is his opportunity to come back here. Let's let's what do they send him so off. The, 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 the ticket sales 52,000, I think, is what they said. 52. That's awfully good even at this point. And I do think with the announcement of Solich or whatever, or with that thing they're going to do with Solich, and they're probably going to be like a, I don't know if they'll put a statue above them, but maybe put his name up, you know? I mean, go like, like wait, anybody in the comments have any guesses? Well, Corner's cor- uh, corner here said, could Frank be getting a role somewhere in the football program or is he getting inducted in Nebraska Hall of Fame? Just trying to figure out what the Frank announcement yeah. is. Uh, I, you know, with, God dang! If I had spent a few minutes even prepping for this, I would almost think he's already in the Hall of Fame. Well, I mean, if nothing else, he was a, a player here in the in the '60s, as a coach then too, or... and as a coach. But I, I feel like that maybe would there'll be... be something in the new new facilities dedicated towards him, like yeah, the that's Frank Solich weight room or something. I mean, I just feel like there's something, whether it's his name goes up on the North Stadium yeah. or or could it be a you know a statue or something? I, I don't know. I, I feel like there's got to be something that that's statue really lasting. Like a lot. Yeah, I don't know that. I, I don't know yet what, what that would look like I exactly. Love Frank but saying a statue seems like that. Well, what I think is cool, the other night, I think it was last night doing a, a fan forum with uh, Redcast Sarah, we talked a little bit about how important it is to have coaching trees. And that's actually something that, that Coach Rule is setting up. And we haven't really had coaching trees at Nebraska since you almost have to go all the way back to Devaney. Devaney had Warren Powers and had Coach. Osborne, he had he had Monty Kiffin, yeah. he had um, Jim Walden, guys that went yeah. on to be P five head coaches. Osborne really didn't have much of a coaching tree because his coaches didn't leave. Yeah. You know, Tenifer was here and 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 McBride, Maybe, like, those guys. Like, but if people would have left, like look at what Solich did when Solich did leave here, mm-hmm. and, and uh, not by his own choice when he left here, he goes on to, to Ohio and they have a field named after him there. Yeah, I mean that guy had yeah. an amazing second career. They took on a, a later age. So I'm excited to see Solich back here. Maybe this is the – we're always trying to find that that one end the curse thing, although I think Trev ended the curse by bringing Rule here, to be honest with you. But uh, yeah. but if this is the uh, if this is a way to kind of do it in a more theatrical kind of way, uh, I, I love seeing Solich get back here. And let's sell it out. If, if it needs to be said, or if Frank needs to hear – that he is more than welcome. Like then it's, then it's long overdue. I, I wonder if he feels that way. I mean, like I think the fans would be more than welcome to like have him back and, and give him a big stand. It, the standing ovation would be huge for Frank. I think when, oh. when he gets announced and, and I mean, it's all wandered on the bridge. You know, he tried as hard as he could. He, he did a really good job, especially look at it from the lens of that we have now 
it's like, wow, that was that was amazing. So it'll be nice just to get him back here, get that out, and uh, start the. The more positive vibes, the better. The, I'm all about including the history, like we talked about, while embracing the future. And, and, and there's no one better at that than Trev. Totally. That round table, I've brought this up a couple times. Where, yeah, with Trev, the round yeah. table, he is so good at that. I almost would love it if, if Solich is coming back for a weekend. I would love to see a round table of Trev with Solich. Maybe you have Osborne there too, or, you, or maybe it's just him yeah. and Solich. And, and what I would love, what I think Trev – did such a good what I, I like the Redcast could host something. Well, hey, the Redcast would, would be a would, great moderator. Well, I, you know, I, I would love that, right? But, but <laughs> what I like about Trevlin in the corner <laughs> the entire time. <laughs> what I like about Trev in that that round table, he brought up some some hard discussions too. He yeah. he didn't just it wasn't just you know all all fluff. And I I think he would handle an interview with Solich really well, like. I think it would be great to see Alberts and him go one on one. Where where Alberts, you know, even just ask him, you know, what what was it like, you know, leaving here? What was it, you know, yeah. this is a place that Solich, for people that don't aren't aware of it. I mean, he came here in one of the first classes of, of Devaney, was here in the six, you know, played here in the sixties, yeah. coached some high school football in in the uh, Omaha and Lincoln areas, you know, up until seventy nine, gets hired here in seventy nine, and he's an assistant coach for yeah. for eighteen seasons here. Had opportunities to go to other schools, stayed here. He's, I think he's at Lincoln Southeast Hall of Fame as a coach. Yeah, I mean, he won championships at the high school level. So I mean, coaching. I mean, it. it he's he's definitely. It's crazy how much of Nebraska history he is, and then at the same time, how long he's been gone in Ohio, and he made a name for himself there. I mean, I mean he, you're talking about a guy with he's the greatest two coach legacies. in their history. Like he's got a very solid, great legacy at Nebraska as a player, as a coach, as an assistant coach here all that time, and then he goes to Ohio, and gets the gets the field named after. Him. Yeah, that's o pretty remarkable. O Osborne brings uh, Craig Bolin here for an undersized fullback. Yeah, that's pretty. Good. Yeah, for an Craig Bull, you know, Osborne brings Craig Bull here, and you know, Bull it didn't work. He got let go from Nebraska, turns around, ends up going up to North Dakota State, yep. and, and creates a dynasty up there. I mean, there's. Osborne had great coaches too. For the most part, those yeah. guys they stuck around here, and that that's I, I've always been curious. Like, what would that what would that tree have looked like if McBride would have branched out yeah. and become a head coach somewhere? If Tenniper would have done that, these are big name guys that you know, you yeah, know, but probably had their opportunities and, and and just never did. But there's something to be said for how good a crew could be if you got it. If you got a group of guys that don't want to be head coaches. I just really want to be a, an assistant. I just really like doing – I don't want to call all the shots. I just want to – like Ron Brown is like the perfect example. Like he, he's just always kind of had a role where he has some kind of effect on the team. But – Yeah. But – Knew his role. And knew his role. Totally knew his role. It, it, it didn't seem like to me like – and it, I'm sure McBride's on the radio enough people have asked him. But he just didn't seem like the guy who wanted a head coach. Neither did Tenenberg to me. And those guys are just like, hey, this is a sweet deal. I love the guys I'm coaching. It's Nebraska. We got the ball. I, I love where I'm looking. Yeah. I, you know, this is a place I want to be. I mean, and those coaches, I think they they counted their lucky stars every day that For they sure. got to be a part of it. Where you see some of these coaches and some of the guys on the staff right now, Coach Rule in particular, when he said, "I want to set set some roots down," and and we picked Lincoln. The family came here. We saw Lincoln, and we saw how cool it was. We see the the. The Haymarket. This is a place I can raise my kids. Is that we've been in you know twenty places in in ten years. It's like we want to just settle mm -hmm. down. Yeah. And I think that when I think back to like a guy like Tenniper, you know, at the end he had to look back on his life and go, "Oh my God, how blessed was I? Oh. I, I got to I got to be I got yeah. to do what I wanted to do, and I got to do where I wanted to do it with the people I wanted to yeah. be with, and and I got to do it for Nebraska, and I got to do it for years and years and years. Like how as a coach. How rare is that, and how amazing is that? I mean, that that is really cool. Yeah, like every every winter, they take a little trip down to Miami, you know, or someplace <laughs> sweet, you know, for a bowl game. It's it's they're winning damn near every game, minus three a season here and there, but challenging. Your coach is rock solid. He's a genius. He's a legend. You're you're like the head. You're the offensive line coach for the pipeline. I don't know. There's something to be said for knowing where you're at and enjoying it and just really hunkering down and, well, and maximizing. Well, so let's let's fast forward I that. Maybe that's probably such a thing in the past. I don't well, know. no, let's not make it a past thing. Let's 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 try to apply some of that to Coach Rule right now, where okay. he's had he's had a staff of guys that at the very least are fiercely loyal to him. I mean, we talked yeah. about that a little bit last night when you and I were we we hot tubbed last night, so we we prepped a little bit. I guess that would be the prep. 
yeah, I guess the prep was the uh, the hot tub. Matt comes down to the to Honky's hot tub and and, and we prep and and we uh, we chat a little football. We almost called this Honky's hot tub. This this whole segment. But. Yeah, but um, you know, I I think you know we were talking about like with that staff how much respect they all have mm. for him. And it's it's the coaches that have that for him, but there's also there's the the behind the scenes people, and 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 we're working on a on an interview with one right now where where um I I've got to see just kind of how the interaction is like. There's respect for the coach. They, they'll reach out to the coach. The coach says, "Hey, uh, uh, don't do anything until after yep. spring ball," and, and they get back and forth with each other. But I mean, it's that you can just sense the respect that they have for the coach. And it's not that they're not ambitious. A lot of these people, for of sure. course, they want to yeah. move on at some point. We always hear about Tony White, the DC yeah. that, uh, you know, he's, he's a head coach and, and waiting somewhere, you know, to give him two, three years here. That's fine. Mm-hmm. If our coaching staff moves on in two or three years, because they are getting promoted, they are getting, they're getting higher positions somewhere else right. because they did such a good job here. That, that is a wonderful position for us to be in it, it, we have to get out of the the hire and fire cycle and we have to get out of the cycle of we hire somebody in two years later you know uh, it's just not working out we need to make a change that that part has to be done that, but if, if someone's moving on because they're they're rising i mean that's that's that's, that's, that's what good programs do that's ideal and, and the other thing we kind of talked about last night when it comes to to rule and how he handles his staff is he's very much He's very much the boss. He had an interesting comment about in this in the press conference about how alluding to how his staff and some of his players feel like he might be a little unapproachable, and he was kind of surprised by that. And but it, but what that tells me is that they know he's the boss, and like Dan and, and they understand that it goes through him. And like I better have my ideas correct if I'm going to go to this guy because he's going to question him. You know, he's going to question where I'm coming from because he wants to know every single detail. He's that kind of guy. I don't like to draw comparisons to. I've just kind of heard that similar kind of thing when people talk about Saban. Saban's not any, but not any of his coaches' best friends. They they go to Saban with their with their P's and Q's tightened up because they don't want to have to face the wrath of. I don't think Rule's a wrath guy, but but that same kind of level of demanding perfection, that same kind mm-hmm. of level of of <clears throat> just. Crossing your T's, dotting your I's. I think he's getting that out of these coaches, but he's also got a young, hungry staff that's eager to do it. It's not like a mean thing. It's not like a. It's not like they're they're scared. It's like the desire to get better and learn and 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 impress him is important. And we'll see how that goes. It's all talk right now. But what did you say last night when we were? Uh, You're talking about. How R- rule said like nobody wants to talk to him or that it's weird like because he's the head coach yeah like, because no. he's the head coach that's the downside is like nobody wants to talk to you he's like they say I'm a little unapproachable and then he asked the media do I seem unapproachable just kind of like I mean there was video I think it was Adam Kruger in Omaha he posted some video from the practice the other day where rule is like just having fun with the media there mm-hmm. and like yelling at him like hey you know. Be careful what you videotape me. You know, my mom watches this. Don't oh, yeah, don't, don't yeah. make me look stupid and all that. Like, just having fun with it. And, um, you know, it, I guess there's parts of me where I'm like, we're still in this honeymoon period oh, with him. Yeah. And we haven't lost any games. We haven't won any games, right? I mean, but but it, it's this honeymoon period. But you also see it with, like, Damon Benning. I've seen him on multiple shows. His show, yeah. he was on No Block, uh, No Rock, where, um, you know, he, he basically was saying – Look, I mean, if you want to drink the Kool-Aid, I'm I'm all for it right now. Like, <laughs> like it's a different approach that the things are things are going right right now, that you can trust that, that you can feel good that things are going right. That's good. And I guess that 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 means something to me. I mean, it's a hell of a it's it's a hell of a job. I'll tell you what, I did not expect I would have told you a lot of different times that the, as the season was wearing on last year, you there's no way you're gonna get me to this emotional state at this time of year again. But here I am. I'm, <laughs> here I'm, I'm I am. Very, I'm very excited. I like what I'm hearing about running backs. I like what I'm hearing about the quarterback room. I like what I'm hearing about. I, I like. I like how he's instructing his coaches to coach. Uh, it feels like Rule has a pretty good. It just seems like Rule is very conscious and very much tracking how this the step to building the program is going, and he knows exactly where they are. Mm-hmm. Like he's, this isn't a concern for him. He's like, no, we're right where we should be for this, you know. But our team's working hard. Like no concern there. 
he, you know, he made a mention of like, oh, I was going to ask you about this because there's a new tradition afoot. Have you heard this new tradition? New tradition. Yeah. And when it comes to like uh, jersey numbers. Oh, single digit thing. Yeah. What do you think of that? I guess I don't really. I don't, I don't have a big opinion on really? it or anything. I mean that that apparently being what a single digit is is so highly thought of that we'll just hold off until you know fall. You have to earn it. I, I, I'm I'm fine with making guys earn everything, and if, if they if they feel like that's something that is meaningful, then uh-huh. cool. I'm, I'm good with it. I mean, it, it's interesting. I I kind I kind of see what he's doing with that. And I, I agree to an extent. I guess this. I I guess I didn't realize that it was universally accepted that the single digits were the were the best. Were the best. I assume some guys have numbers outside of the single digits that are favorite. I mean, if you're an offensive lineman, the rule of offensive lineman is you have to be from fifty to seventy nine. Right. If you're not touching a football, but literally anyone else, and you start to see these D line. Yeah. yeah, you're seeing D linemen coming in at number nine, number yeah. eight. Um, but this gets us into that conversation about the spring and everything. And as you're watching along, you got questions, throw them in here. We'll, we'll incorporate them into what our conversation is right now. And uh, if you, if there's a position group or whatever, but I, you know, I think just for the sake of it, let's start with, there's a lot of different Jersey colors out there right yeah, now. Yeah, We've yeah. got green jerseys for quarterbacks, but nice. also for a couple guys that have, uh, have been injured and they're, they're trying to, you know, uh, preserve some of the hits so on them. Yellow. What's the yellow then for the other quarterbacks? Like, not nothing. Yeah, the yellow ones are the guys that like, like Thompson and Smothers mm-hmm. were wearing yellow, and that they're just flat just out not. You can't even hop in a drill or whatever. They're they're barely throwing the ball right now. Gotcha. Um, you have gray jerseys that were just announced, and so uh, Jalil Martin and then um, uh, AJ Rollins, guys that are yeah. playing both like both sides of the ball, multiple yep. positions, mm-hmm. and that's part of any coaching transition. But in particular, Coach Rule has made a history mm-hmm. of of players changing positions. And I love it because what it is, is instead of thinking of guys as being a five-star or a four-star, or instead of thinking them as, Oh, they're a wide receiver. Or they're running back. They're football players at number one. Mm-hmm. At, at the beginning, they're, they're athletes and they're football players. Most of these guys, if you were a kicker, you probably played quarterback when you were in seventh grade, right? I mean, oh, there, sure. there's this, yeah. this, you're good athletes. Yeah. And so you can play multiple things. And, if the guy doesn't work out one position, he may transfer. That's always an option. But we also don't have to just kick him off the team. That that there's ways to move guys around. I always thought AJ Rollins with his length and everything. I always thought defensively that that he was primed, especially if you're going to do some three four stuff as an outside um, backer edge guy at six foot six, six foot five, and and you get we, him into that 240 we range. We brought that up when because when he was recruited, it was both. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't like we exclusively brought it up. It was being. Eh, it's kind of us. I know, but a lot, <laughs> I mean, a lot of times we all know what the counterpart to a position is on each side of the right. ball. A tight end can be an outside linebacker. A, you know, a D tackle can be a guard. Um, back in the day, running backs can be linebackers. linebackers. Yeah. That that was the thing. The, a difference that happened in in recruiting over the years is if you went back to like, oh, you know, back to the eighties. A lot of teams would recruit six or seven running backs, sure. and the four, the three or four that didn't make it, the, the ones that weren't good enough to be running back, yeah. became your linebackers. Right, same body types and builds. But what you would end up always having is, is essentially the guys that aren't good enough to be on this side play on the other side, and you'd see defenses that didn't didn't have the same talent level yeah. that the offense did. Yeah, it was the Miamis and the Florida States of that era going into the 90s where you started recruiting for defense, guys that were specific for those spots, but wide receivers and corners. These are, you know, yeah. similar body types. And so A.J. Rollins fits right into that. He He's does. a guy that can, you know, could he be a tight end for us? He could. I don't know that – I don't see him right now. Unless he does something spectacular, you look at that tight end room right now. That was now. my question to you. I, does I, that I, tell you that the tight end room is really good? Or does it tell you that the defensive ends need more? Or whatever he's going to be. Because What position is – I know he's. What's the? Thing? I would I would call him like an edge. An edge, okay. I mean, it, that's what I would think of him as. I, I would just simply say that, look, if recruiting if recruiting numbers mean anything, if recruiting and we stars, all know they do, and if recruiting stars mean the anything, recruiters are really smart somewhere. And on this it, map. so if Fedoni is healthy, uh-huh. and Gilbert looks all the part that everyone that we've read says. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know why that that tight end room would need to go much deeper than that. I mean, they, now they've talked about doing 13 personnel for Christ's right. sakes, getting three tight ends on the field. So 
there's ways to do it, but they've got a lot of tight ends already. And if you're Rollins, I mean, this is an opportunity. It's a fresh start to try something different here. Now, but they also lose Hickman too. I mean, I yeah, I don't, I I, I don't, I'm not too worried about the 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 tight end room as far as depth. It feels like it's probably pretty strong to me. If he's more, it sounds like it, as far as the reps go, he's already kind of flashing a little bit on the defensive side. Keep him there. I, he's athletic. I like. What was, what was it? Prince Akamaladam? Akamaladam? Mukamara? No. Oh, oh, oh no. Uh, no. Prince Will no, 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 no. no. Freedom Akamaladam. <laughs> okay, yes. Remember him tight end? He went to defensive end. Correct. Yes. And yeah. He, he ended up doing okay. Well, we, okay. Had, we had Cody Glenn. Freedom Akamaladam. <laughs> we had Cody Glenn on the, the fan forum yes. three or four weeks ago. Yep. Cody was a three-year running back yep. here. And then when Bo Pelini got here, again, a transition, a coaching transition. Mm-hmm. When when Pelini got here, they reimagined some of the players. They take Cody from being a, a running back to a linebacker, st- plays some special teams. Before you know it, he's getting drafted yeah. by the Colts, and he's playing in the pros. He plays in the Super Bowl, special teams, and he's playing defense. So, yeah, cool. again, you know, we don't Tierra have to – Greens did it. He went from running back to, yeah. to safety. Uh, Major Colbert played – Major 20, Colbert. He played 20 – he played 20 positions that on you know, yeah. Don't do what they did to Major. Yeah, don't do what you did to they Major. They did Major dirty. He had to like punt a ball at some point, I bet. I mean, <laughs> right? I mean, was he holding kicks? I mean, I don't know. He did about every position on the, on the team. And then he get hurt. Who's the guy? Oh, it was Charles. <sighs> Not Charles Wilson. Well, well, you think of that. I think this it's is the a safety good... that was going to be so amazing, but he kept blowing. Oh, Charles him. Jackson. Was it Charles Jackson? I think that's every nice. year that guy's going to change yeah. the world. I think this is a, a, a good point here. Corner, skirt, corner. Um, I think Rule is just an expert uh, expert on roster management. He'll get the numbers right for each position. We needed more at the edge for sure. That's definitely part of it uh, with all the position changes. I absolutely agree with you, corner, skirt, corner. I, I, this is about roster management. We've said this since the beginning of the Redcast six years ago, how roster and before NIL and before transfer portals, we were already at that time in 2017 saying that's a full-time job that, oh, sure. that you hire somebody that's just your sure. ro- roster management, you know, analyst or roster management specialist, whatever it is, because right now it's a great problem to have, but we're still at a hundred, you know, scholarships. Yeah. We still need to get that down. When we had Sipple on in at the end of January, he mentioned how with NIL, he's like, you might, we could be over the 85 limit yeah. with guys that would be scholarship guys that are getting NIL money right. instead. And, and we kind of asked like, well, how many do you think? And you know, it's not going to be 15, but maybe five, there might be five guys that should be scholarship guys, but end up just being NIL guys. And if you could do that with the Nebraska kids too. So it was like in state tuition. So it wouldn't have to be crazy. The, the and, higher that number could be. Absolutely. And, and if the package of NIL is good enough for it, the, the, the point is, is that conceivably what, where right now we say, hey, we have 100 scholarships, maybe maybe we don't have to drop 15 of them. Maybe we can get it down 10, down to about 90, yeah. where NIL fills some gaps. That's It's possible. I'm sure. just saying it's possible. But it's certainly we can't sit here at, at 100. I mean, that's just – I don't think anyone looks at that as being realistic. No. So that roster management piece that you're talking about there, Corner, is that you know we, we still do need to – as much as we want these guys getting developed and we want to see – all this progress, there's still there's going to have to be some changes there. The quarterback room still has he six guys comment. on scholarship. He's and made a couple is, comments about the the defensive back room being huge, you know. So yeah, you kind of you kind of wonder if he's sort of alluding to some of these guys need to process. You know what I mean? I, I don't know. It'd be interesting the, to see where he thinks. I mean, think of the quarterback room right now. They yeah. brought in. We had six. We have six scholarship guys on quarter at quarterback. And and I've already I've, I've like I'll need to look up the name I forgot it already or somebody write it down please in the comments if you know it but an old Miss guy came here as a walk off oh, a transfer yeah and he was right. he was playing yeah I, I you know what I mean this is it's I think so he's number nineteen I don't know um, we had a we had Mike Babcock on one time and he was struggling to remember like an offensive guard from nineteen seventy and, and he couldn't remember the name and it's like sometimes. I have so many names going through my head and so much to try to remember. And it's like, until you get on the field or until I see something, it's like, I, I almost can't even put you to memory well, at this point, unless I, think, I have it on you know, my nose. Especially at this, at this stage of the game, it, 
you really do need to do something on the field. And then I will remember you easily, but it's hard to just, you know, with the double numbers and a hundred guys on the roster right now and the transfer portal guys. And like, it's just kind of hard to keep up with all of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brewmaster bill there. I agree. Several people think an NIL will be in house and in three to five years, you know, I think that's part of what earlier when we mentioned how, how Trev is building the, the athletic department and, and, and planning for the future. Mm -hmm. That's part of that. It's got to be, look, he doesn't, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what's exactly going to happen with, with um, how the NCAA is going to handle this or, or if sure they're even going to be, I'm sure to be exquisite. Well, or even if they're going to be a part of this, right? I mean, there's, when we talked with Osborne last year, Osborne, he's like, I'm not predicting this is going to happen, but he also said, but it wouldn't surprise me if we saw the P5 schools, essentially those conferences just, break off. just, just breaking off and doing their own thing. And, who knows if you're if you're in Trev's position right now? What you need to do is you need to build a bank up, and you need to be prepared for whatever gets thrown your way. And and it's better to have mm -hmm. more in that bank than less. And and you want to just you just want to be ready for whatever the future is going to. I don't throw know that you. he's not doing that, but oh, I, but I feel like he definitely is. I've, I don't know you? he's doing that. Yeah, I mean, he, he it, feels it, like the I, kind of guy that's like, oh, I'm on that already. I'm yes, he guys oh. on that. Yeah, we're not talking to Trev when we're having this conversation. Trev knows this. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah, is yeah. this is we, we didn't, didn't Trev didn't just go, oh shit. <laughs> right <laughs> now. Yeah. This God is, damn it, they're this, right. This this is the well, you said the G D word, and your mom is gonna probably watch this, man. Oh Trev said that. <laughs> Trev said I didn't say that. I uh <laughs> there was one time, okay, when we were just doing an audio only show, uh -huh. so it was a couple years ago, and uh, it, we 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 cuss very rarely on it you know we throw a little s-bomb here or yeah. there out you know nothing too bad but one time i said i said the gd word Ooh. and and matt and the and the irish catholic family and everything i mean it was uh you're catholic too i know well yes but well not irish and, <laughs> and but he was like his mom's like you don't it doesn't matter what age i am name in vain dude you don't you That's don't say get it, you so. i think she rarely lets that just slide <laughs> So, Without some sort of disapproving. So you just threw gesture. that out there. You well, just... now Trev said that, <laughs> and I mean, you know, I guess it's artistic license. Yeah, here we go. Uh, Tony? We... Frank Dickerson, what do you think of Gundy's idea of player contracts? Oh, I guess I, I'll be honest with you. I haven't read. So obviously we're I, at, uh, Mike Gundy, I'm, I'm sure is what you're talking about at Oklahoma State. Sure, I haven't probably. heard about that, but the idea of player contracts, I mean – What's interesting is it, it wouldn't shock me at all. And it to me, it's an evolution. When you go back to like the 1940s, I remember watching a thing where Keith Jackson talked about grant and aids, essentially what a scholarship is. And it was very controversial back then that how would, how could you give kids scholarships, grant and aids to play football? What if a kid gets hurt? Are they employees of the, right. of the state or are they, under, uh, you know, would, would they get workman's comp if they get injured? Those were concerns that were thrown out in 1940s yeah. when when just the idea of a scholarship was out there. Um, absolutely, at this point, if, if well, it's you, all on the table. Right? If you gave me contract, look, here's the thing with a contract. Right now, right now is a sweet time in this this kind of honeymoon period of NIL. It's a sweet time to be a player because you can make a lot of money in NIL before I think. Eventually, advertisers and, and sponsors are going to so kind of normalize agents? this. Are but but the other thing is, you can go and make a bunch of money right now doing NIL, and then go sit out a bowl game. Yeah. And you go back just five years ago, and and you weren't making that money, and you know the 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 likelihood of just sitting out a bowl game that was harder to do. And so, um, now, look, I, I don't know that I, it's a good time to be a player. I'll just I, say I, that. Well, right now it is, but it, right now it is, but but as soon as like the contracts and the and the collectives go in house. They'll quickly take all that, most of that power back away from the players. It, it'll become a lot more regimented, I think, in the future. And then it's going to be, I like, I like the idea about contracts in some ways, but in other ways, I see them being something that's going to be a big pain in the ass. You know, like players leaving unhappily, and, and then like does the transfer portal come in? What if somebody does get hurt? Does the whole team get disgruntled? You just have like. Guys sitting out because they're not happy with their contract because they're overperforming it or something well, like that. I think that it's part, like part of the contract and what, what we've heard about with NIL is that it's about it. It's not contracts, but it's that it's a it's proof of performance. 
uh, if you're going to get money for NIL, that there's supposed to be some kind of proof of performance. At the end of the day, so you think it'd be like a sliding scale based well, on your position and your output. It, it, proof of performance doesn't mean on the field stuff. It means off the well, field sure. stuff. It, you know, so uh, you're supposed to go and show up at, at five events at a car lot. And if you do that, you get paid X amount. Well, oh, then, I see then you, you have to I show you. proof that you went you're and did that. Like in the classroom, that, I'm like, well, that's not. It. No, the, the the problem I think with NIL right now is that you know there are guys that can that can essentially just get money, right. and then you get to the end of the season, they still might set out a game. Like right. how compare that to like to the Carlos Crawford, right? Didn't he? He's, well, he's already gone, isn't he? Or sure. He, well, he had the injury, but imagine but, think of a pro player, a pro player to to that point there uh, from Frank is that. They're under contract. If a pro player is making X amount of money mm-hmm. and then they get to the 16th game of the season and, and you're two and 14, you don't have any chance at the, at the playoffs. Mm-hmm. That player isn't just going to sit there and say, well, I'm not, I'm just going to sit this game out. This game doesn't mean anything to me. <laughs> I mean, that yeah. team, that team has, there's repercussions to that. That team could sit there and say that's, that can vo- yeah. void a, a contract. You can't just sit out, but in college right now, we still see some of that. And, we're just in a weird it's, period. It's, it's, it's so an in-between weird. time, and it's an overused analogy, but it's still an accurate one. To me, it still is a wild west. Well, there's going to yeah, we're really early in that. Like we could do the contracts, and there's going to be a bunch of blunders in the beginning because we're not they're not going to be structured right at first until it all kind of settles down, including the transfer portal. Like, what are we going to do with that? Because if if you're going to keep that super easy and fluid then contracts are going to be really hard. Or is that what's the only thing going to keep kids is contracts as opposed to the transfer portal? Is that how well, you mitigate the transfer this portal is, is through long-term contracts? I can tell you, I can tell you, I think what Matt Rule would say to that is that if that's what it's going to take to keep those kids here, then I'm fine with not getting those kids here. He he is so – I mean, we, we haven't really hit on the big recruiting weekend last week. Oh, yeah. But you know one of the things I like about how he talked about it was – it didn't seem too big to him. Like we had all the, we had five star kids and four star kids and big time guys from all over the place. And, and, and we all met coach rule. When is this kid going to sign? And coach rules like, yeah, you know, they, <laughs> they came here. Yeah, they, we got, we got him here and we got him to see Lincoln and, and we, we, we showed him what we do. And you know what, if they like it, that's awesome. And, and I hope we're a great fit for them. And if we're a great fit for them, man, this could be something that works. And if it's not, or if they don't like this, I mean, if it, ta- if it takes that gigantic contract and that's the only thing, if they need, if they need um, guarantees of playtime and all those things, they're probably coming to the wrong place. You are, because you can't guarantee 22 guys starting positions or 25 guys started. We saw that, honestly, to be quite honest with you, 2005, that Thank number you. one recruiting class. Yep. You can't promise 28 guys starting positions nope. when a, you don't have that many spots. And so what you end up, what you end up with is the, math. you get the yeah, math is hard, right? <laughs> but you get the number one recruiting class, but then a year later you get about half of them bolted. Yeah. And so I don't think that's what Coach Rule wants right now with recruiting. Mm-hmm. I think he wants to develop programs. And, and part of the development is getting the right guys in here in the first place yeah. that are willing to, to, if it's take time, are willing to grow into a position, are willing to switch positions, willing to be mm-hmm. part of the team. And if you're not, then there's going to be someone else who's going to be there to take your spot. And I mean, that's where I think the coaches can start to get some power back. Right now, it seems like the players have all the power. Mm-hmm. Hey, pay me some money, and I get to play when I want to and sit out when I want to. I like Coach Rule's approach to this. Oh, yeah. Which is, I mean, look, look, we're all in this together, and and I'm going to give you opportunities, but, man, you've got you've to meet these standards, too. And we're setting these standards now. Anthony Grant mm-hmm. and, and uh, you know, uh, the, the – one other guy last week, Omar uh, Brown. Omar, was it, yeah, was it? it was no, um, but it was, oh, was uh, Tommy Hill, to Tommy Hill. Yeah, yeah. That you know, you're gonna sit out, and, and nobody thought that Anthony Grant was off the team or anything. No, it was, but it was just, too, but though. it was more just, and he was very clear about that. It was just more. These are some standards. You're gonna meet these things, and, and when you meet them, you're gonna get back on. I like his answer about the doghouse or good, good graces or something like that. He goes, "You're always in my good graces, you're or something like that with me. We just have behaviors. We'll just correct them." doesn't mean I don't love you. It just means we got to get this fixed, mm-hmm. you know, but um, they, the, going back to that big recruiting weekend, it's, um, you know, the most important players that were on campus this weekend were the ones on the team, you know, and, yeah. and, 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 and as important as this recruiting weekend was, is, and maybe will be to the future. Not, it's not more important than the development, the team that we're developing right now, because 
whether we land most of these guys or not, it showed that we could get that caliber of player in here. You know, I understand that that D- that Dylan has a big role in that. I understand that he has yeah. a lot of pull. He's, I, a, ca- I, he's I, a catalyst for sure. For sure, he brings that in there. But now, but but now they've all seen it, and. And he's, not, and he's not – apparently I heard today he's not going to be here for the spring game. Not to overreact one way or the other to that. And he's been here 15 times already. Yeah, so. I mean, he's – you know, Sipple said this a lot of times. It's pretty clear. They, they really enjoy the process. They're college football fans. This is cool for them to go see. It'd just be like you and me. Oh, and like if I'm getting the man. back seat or the, you know, behind the curtain tour of all these places. I told, I told you my tour of Tennessee, and I'm not yeah. a volunteer exactly. fan. Exactly. I, I, let me be – Full disclosure, I, I don't like the Tennessee Volunteers, but Dude. it was amazing just the, the, to, to walk around there, to be in a uh, to be in the locker yeah. room and see where Peyton Manning's locker is and everything. It, it, my, my son, you know, gets the, 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 the guy held him up and he touched the, the sign yeah, yeah, yeah. right as you're, you're going on onto the field. Look, Imagine that's that. cool. Exactly. Uh, you know, look, I'm not going to probably ever be back there again, but it was it was it's if you love college football mm-hmm. and the rail is. Perfect example yeah. of that. And imagine going on a recruiting trip with your oldest son who's being wowed by or wooed by And you're bringing the younger and you're son. Bringing the, and you all get to go do these sweet, sweet tours. They're not doing us dirty by doing all these tours. I mean, it, listen, first off, he's the number one recruit in the nation. So that's that's just different territory. We don't have expectations for how this recruiting goes because we don't, we don't play up here very often. So we, we got to chill out on that. Whether we get him or not, I feel like he's given us a very fair shake in the recruiting process. Yeah, and he's and he's shown us respect. Like there's, there's, we haven't been disrespected at all in this process. He's brought guys into the doors for us for sure. The point I'm trying to make is the and the reason I said the most important players are the ones on the team is if we have a good year, an eight win year, that 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 does enough to kind of keep the momentum from something like this to go forward. Cause don't forget Dylan's got a little brother. Sure. who's about what, two years away from maybe yeah. being another top prospect with, That'd with, be a, with cool. an offer, right? With so. an offer. So we could, we could cycle this all back up in two, three years. What is he? Two years younger, three. Yeah. Two or three In three years. And rule has been doing this now for three years and we build up a good team. And you think about a recruiting weekend that time when you've got a top prospect quarterback, yeah. bringing in all those guys that, it's just – it's more proof of of the work that these guys are doing to kind of get this in. And, and like you said, it wasn't – it wasn't they were tripping all over themselves for this guy. They made it a real chill weekend. Everybody yeah. just had a nice time. And from what, the, from what the recruiting heads are talking about, it sounds like everyone was just kind of raving about how nice and chill but cool the weekend was. And, and it's a good vibe at Nebraska right now. And, again, honeymoon period is – this is as sweet as it gets. You know, we're going to play a spring game and guarantee we're going to win. And we're going to have sweet. It's going to be really good. We've got a really good stretch here we should just enjoy. The Dylan sweepstakes, it's it's real. I still think we're alive in this. But it's going deep. It's going really deep. It's going to go. I mean, he's got he's got visits set up to what, like June, July? Yeah. August maybe on some of those. So that might not be settled for a while. So, <sighs> That's going to be a longer process than maybe you necessarily want. And the only thing I'd have negative to say about that is, I suppose, if you were going to get the number one recruit in the nation and that guy's a quarterback, you would like him on board early so you could use him to recruit up. Mm -hmm. But, well, you know, again, another good question here from Corner Corner. What will we do for QB in the 2024 class if Rayola goes somewhere else? Will we be forced to hit the portal once again? Look, right Maybe now, six call, scholarship yeah, right now, we're, yeah. I mean, everything's one step at a time, right? So we have six scholarship quarterbacks on on the team yeah. right now. Um, now, season gets done, and we know that Casey Thompson is going to be at the very least graduating and moving on. Right. Um, Jeff Sims is – you know, kind of the heir apparent, if nothing else, to be your 2024 quarterback, if he isn't even your 2023 quarterback. Right. There's people that have him on the early Heisman, excuse me, Heisman. Um, uh, sure. You know, that always works out and everything. yeah, that works out great, doesn't it? So, <laughs> but they, 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 you have Torres, you have Hein Heinrich, Henrik Heimer, you have a uh, uh, Purdy, you know, so we, and Smothers still. So there's all those guys. And then the way that the portal works is, yeah, it ends up filling in gaps if you miss somebody. 
you know, Danny Kalin uh, from Bellevue West, a 2024 yeah. guy, he recently committed to Missouri. Nebraska, I don't know how many I, – I asked this question on Twitter, and I didn't get a, a response yet from anybody. And I, I've sent it even to some recruiting people. Like, how many actual – offers do we have out because it was a knock on frost during the frost era that it we were always like one of the highest offer schools like in the country yeah. like we would throw out 350 offers right. and iowa as an example would off you know about a, a hundred and it was more like are they just being more selective or are we just throwing everything at the wall and hoping something sticks i don't know exactly where we're at with that i do know from a quarterback in the 2024 class perspective mm -hmm. it was kind of like we kind of had two offers out there kaylin who we had offered a year ago well before rule got here and then this you know it rails and it's not that the, it's not that all the chips are on him right. if he went somewhere else it's not like there's it's impossible that some other quarterback in this entire large nation that we have could step up and and become a player right um and then if it is a, a portal thing uh when you treat people right, there's always a chance that people will come back. I'll throw someone out like a, a Zane. Tristan Jebbia. No, sorry. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. Oh. Sorry. I thought that's where you're going to uh, throw it every no. now. Um, but like, but like, like Zane Flores. Oh, yeah. From oh, right now. Like no, no. Look, maybe he goes out and has crazy amount of success at, at Oklahoma State. I, I wish him well. I don't wish him anything poorly. Um, he wasn't offered by us until, <laughs> until Rule got here. But Rule – did what he could in a short period of time. And so if anything would ever happen with Zane down there, I'm just using him as, as an example. If anything would ever happen with him, I think we'd be in good position to try to bring him back. Cool. And that's just one example. I mean, there. so it, it, I'm not getting too fixated on just Rayola. Rayola is unique because of a number of reasons. Yeah, He's the number one yeah. recruit in the country. He happens to also be a legacy. I mean, for how sure. many times do those two things, yeah. you know, align for us? Very, very, but never. But if it doesn't, if we don't get him, it's not the end of the of the world either. And and we need to ride with the horses that we have right now, anyways. Agree. Every single kid that came in here last weekend, and I hope we get our good share of them. Every one of them is not going to be here in the fall. Right. They're not playing here. Right. And so when it comes to the the most important quarterback right now is whoever's going to be lining up against Minnesota on on August thirty first, and then you know when you think about a guy like Jeff Sims. That might we might have our our starters for the next two seasons at that position already right. well entrenched into the team right now mm -hmm. and and so uh, there's a lot of time between now and whenever that 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 quarterback who's going to follow that person up is. I think we were well situated this year to to kind of put our put all of our eggs in one basket so to speak with, yeah with the quarterback and just go for a home run ball with Riola. If we don't get him, it's just. It's just so different nowadays with the transfer portal. I just don't even worry about it. I just think there's been quarterbacks in the wings pretty much all the time. And mostly what I want is to have a, a good quarterback that can uh, – or a quarterback coach and a good uh, head coach that can convey a system to a guy and make him run it. I Like if Casey Thompson has a really good year this year, mm -hmm. then I know we've got really good coaches. Well, you, you, know? you, you just said something. Maybe this is the way we can – maybe we'll end this on, on, on this – discussion okay you just said that you know he'll have a good system and everything let's talk about the system for a second because it doesn't okay. there's not a lot of discussion yet or we haven't had a chance to see a lot yet uh the the um we might be able to get some press passes by the way um for some some practices or something i've, I've tried talking a little oh, bit with her dad on this God. which would be insane if we could get that that's that's the side point i have um, a hold on <laughs> but um and I'm going to keep pressuring them on that because of too, because we're on our spring practices. Yeah, and we we should get into one, but that's beyond the point. This is um, when when you think about the 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 system. Mm -hmm. In my head, you know, I saw the everyone saw the the option play that Heinrich Harburg ran that they showed on social media. Yeah, he ran one, and right. you know, green jersey option. I mean, gross. <laughs> I know, I know, but it's but it's the option. It's part Might of. Might as well be pink. Yeah, it's part of the <laughs> offense. If you ran it, it's part of the offense, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is be a when we talk about system, everything we know about Satterfield and everything that we know about uh, a rule is that this is going to be a pro style offense. Uh -huh. And and what that means what is, do you I think, think of when you think of that. Like when I think of, when I think of pro style, I think about getting under center. I think about huddling. I think about I think about big sets of fullbacks and tight ends. OK, I mean, and there's a hundred different types of pro style at, at the end of the day. But I think of two backs and I think of 13 do you, personnel. And do you have a power five 
comparable objects that you would use that you would point to and say it might it probably will look a little like this. Oh, geez. I mean, 2022. I mean, my guess in, in a, a modern day pro style. Yeah. Maybe what Michigan, maybe. Oh. I mean, you think about them. They got under center. They were a, a, a power team. They would have double tights. They, they still you think they, will have more of they a quarterback still, run element. Well, than they that do? was the thing that Michigan also could do a little bit of. So, yeah, which is which is different, there. which is different than like the Iowa Wisconsin oh, yeah. power or um, uh, pro style. Where I mean, you had a quarterback that was a stick in the mud, couldn't move. Uh, they've clearly, if nothing else, the the bringing in Jeff Sims and the QBs that we have on the staff, they want a QB that can move, sure. run the ball. Now, does that mean that you're running option with them or how much? I want to see them move in the pocket, if nothing else. That was the thing that drove me crazy all year with Whipple was just sitting in a pocket and 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 taking yeah, the quarterback's gotta, legs you, out of you, it. You gotta stop me. It's really dumb when you have somebody who can move, that's it's able to move, and then you make him a sitting duck. You yeah, I mean, here pro style offense has always felt like a dirty word in Nebraska, and I agree. When it was being done under Callahan and under Riley, it, well, it, was, it, it felt like but, that. But Callahan was so West Coast though. That's less even pro style than it sure. was West Coast. But it was also sometimes taking a quarterback and neutering him, take taking the the skills he already had. Hey, uh, you know Tommy Armstrong or Joe Daly. We're gonna take we're gonna take what you do Daly, well, sure. and we're just gonna take you, get your feet out of it. Mm-hmm. You're you're not gonna do that. You're gonna sit in the pocket. That's what you're gonna be. And I've always said this: it's the quarterback position gets so misused by so many teams sure. where they they'll go out and they'll recruit a five star dual threat QB to turn him into a pocket guy. And and I've always used the the the, the equation. Say, what's it? I'm gonna say Ron Paulus from Notre well. Dame. Uh, actually, I wasn't even gonna go there, but Paulus is a good example. Oh. Like. Osborne didn't really – Paulus was a – he would have been the equivalent of a five-star quarterback. He, for was, the, he, was, the, he was the Trevor Lawrence. And and so he was like a five-star QB Jimmy back in the uh, mid-'90s. Bino Cook said he was going to win two uh, Heismans while he was at Notre minimum. Dame. Minimum. And Osborne really didn't even offer him because yeah. at that point, his skill set, he was a drop-back QB. Why would Nebraska go after a guy that's so different? Well, Notre Dame was the exact same thing back then. Yep. Tony Rice was a quarterback. They had Kevin McDougal. They had they had option QBs, and they had option linemen. They had yep. option running backs. They had option everything. And then they go out and they get a drop-back QB, Ron Palace, that didn't fit anything that they were doing. So why would you do that? Why would you just blow up everything just to get one guy? Up. It ruined Notre and, Dame for a minute. It did. And, and the thing is – you see that with quarterbacks all the time. Let's go and recruit that five-star guy, and then let's get Lamar Jackson, and then let's force him to, into being a, a, a dropback guy. And the, what I was going to get at earlier is the equation I give to that is go. imagine being a pro coach, like a pro offensive coordinator, okay. and you get Peyton Manning. And you go and you run you, – you, you play a game with Peyton Manning, and you run 40 options in the game, and you lose it. <laughs> and Peyton Manning looks terrible running yeah. options. After the game, would anybody sit there and say Peyton Manning's a terrible quarterback? No. They would go, why are you running 40 options with Peyton Manning? Fire that offensive coordinator. What are you doing? But it doesn't happen the reverse way. You go and recruit a a, a dual-threat QB and try to make him into some pro-style guy and have him throw it 40 times a game, and he's not great at that that one thing. And then people are like, well, that's not a good quarterback. And I'm like, you're using him shitty. I think wow. there are times I've seen us use quarterbacks in, in ways that the, the, the skill sets that they have, it didn't maximize it. Mm-hmm. So I guess pro style to me in, in one way is I think you can build, you can build pro style around the skills of that QB. Okay. If you're Steve young at, in a pro style at, at, at San Francisco back in the day, you can do more rollouts. He's a more mobile QB. Agreed. If you're Joe Montana, as just as an example, maybe you're doing more dropback stuff. But yeah. it, 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 so you can build it a little bit more around those skill sets. I just know that they appreciate well, the skill sets of a mobile QB right now because that's what we have on on the staff. And I think I think there's probably like a a, a bare minimum amount of mobility they're going to require from these quarterbacks, like a like a basement level. Yeah, of that's a good point. But but like, what's the what's the basement level uh, throwing ability like? It, you know, because Riley was always kind of like, I need a guy that if the coverage is right, is the protection is right, can throw the ball and gets there every time. That's, that's the a good, first that's... thing I want done. What is it with these guys? That's a good point. 
So and Ro- and Frost was like a quick blinker. That was their their thing that they wanted. I I tend to think if I'm a, if I'm reading what what rules saying correctly, it feels like to me the offense is going to be fairly amorphous to the talent around it, and which is good because you know like Callahan's system was completely dead in the water with somebody like Joe Daly, you know, and that's, so that's no good. You can't have yeah. a system that you can't run if you can't recruit to it. So. So maybe you could have a guy like Casey Thompson who is mobile but not necessarily a dual threat. And you could also have a guy like Jeff Sims who's maybe, to me at least, seems more like a dual threat but can throw. Yeah, And it can work either way because you can kind of lean it towards strengths one way or the other. That to me is a far more um, – oh, you have a, a higher chance of being consistent throughout the years on offense if you can do that versus – you're totally dependent on recruiting yeah. this one particular type of guy and he cannot get hurt mm. because he's the only one on the team that can do it. It just seems mm. like um, we've kind of been stuck a couple times with those guys. Like when we had, you know, when it went to Tommy Armstrong to Riker Fife problem. Oh I, yeah. I mean, that's, and that's a roster management issue yeah. because before that season started, we had, um, gosh, I can't think of his name. It was the QB that left and ended up going over to, to Virginia tech and then played against us when he was, uh, he was a lefty. And he was at Indy, Illinois yes. in 2018. I, I, I'm totally AJ, forgetting. No. Bush, Bush. Bush. Yeah, AJ Bush. Yeah. And and we let him go in August. Yeah. And he had skill sets similar to what Breon oh, Carnes. Well, he yeah. had. Oh, my God. <laughs> but he had skill sets similar to, to, to Armstrong. Yeah. We lose him right before the season starts. Yep. And to your point, the second Armstrong got hurt, now you're going between him yeah, and Fife. It, you don't even have the same kind of right. skill sets. But I think at the end of the day, the one thing with the pro style that I really like. If, it, if done right, is that you can get a lot of different position groups out there and you can give a lot of looks. Right. When, when you asked the famous question to Coach Osborne last year that we still have sometimes pinned to our to our tweet yeah. um, or Twitter page, and it was, you know, how did you how did you, uh, you know, seemingly, you know, you know, beat all these teams running the same four plays? And Osborne goes, well, we only ran one play. Yeah. But when Osborne broke it down, he was like, but what we did we is. We always joke like that with each other. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. You and Tom. But. But but what he did, what and what Coach Osborne really did, which was just amazing, his use of formations and personnel groupings, how we would go from five wides to double tights with full house backfields and every conceivable thing in between. Mm-hmm. You could run the same play, but if you do it with different personnel groups and different formations, it totally changes how the play is run. Right. Or that Tommy Frazier up the gut for 40 yards right. running a trap. That's a fullback trap without the fullback. Right. It's just it's just you're you're doing it at a different set. You're spreading a defense out and hitting them in mm-hmm. a spot. And so I'm interested to see what they can do with different personnel groups because if you're going to go and put the potential of three tight ends on the field at one time, yeah. if you're going to put a fullback on the field, if you're going to – you know, last year we pretty much exclusively in the Mark Whipple offense had three receivers on the field, one tight end, one running back. And every once in a blue moon, we might go to two tight ends and take one wide receiver off. But how many times would I say, hey, get two, two running backs? How can you How can you just – you can't just throw your hands up in the air when you're getting sacked time and time again and go, well, our O-line sucks. Well, well this is just – change some things up. Give some different looks. And I think that's the thing that they can do. How hard will it be for you to go into this season without any preconceived notions about the team? Because it's an entirely different team. You know, all the all the things they've been subject to. The little things are killing us again. There's really no again, but it's like but it'd be interesting to 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 watch this. I'm just really interested to see the game day performance. Like it sounds like the way he's running things, the little things that have killed us over these last number of years, if those went away. Don't you think you'd see that? I'm like, don't you well, feel like that'd be like a – Well, again, that's the conversation we've had. Are they little things or are they basics, right? I mean, it's it, – you know, if you're missing 30-yard field goals from the hey, – from the, Termites are little things. Yeah. But if you have enough of them, it's a big problem. Well, that's – and that's exactly it. You, you miss 30-yard field goals from dead center, that's a problem. If you get extra points blocked and return for two points, that's a problem. If you're punting to the wrong side of the field, that's a problem. If you have five yeah. offensive linemen penalties yeah. from five different offensive yeah. linemen, that's a penalty. Yeah. Or that's an issue. If you have two – pre-snap penalties before you even snap the ball in the game. Okay, I get it. It's bad. It's all I bad. I can go down yeah. a list. Stop. What a total you know? stop. I can go. I can, well, I can keep going. Will needs to be somewhere that's less than 2 a.m. more than Casey last year. I would, yeah, was, I would that was, say that that's probably fair. Mentioned. I don't think – I'd say Casey, Casey 
would be the basement. I think Casey's got enough mobility. Maybe we'll see. You, yeah. I, I could see where you're going. I with think that. with PJ's right here, Casey ran well later in the year, like Wisconsin. Also knew how to absorb contact, unlike Purdy. Yeah, but the Purdy, thing- Purdy as a runner, from all this talk about his GPS times and everything like that, it shocks me. Yeah, because watching him in game, I thought unless he was hurt, last I thought game, he looked good at the end of the Oklahoma game, but that was fourth quarter of you know, blowout and who knows. But but I thought Casey as an example, there was a fourth and three, I think it was against Purdue last year, where it norm. I mean, it. I don't even know what they called him. I don't know if they called him zone reads or just hand. But he pulled it one time, and if the receiver would have made the block, mm-hmm. he still got five yards. He still got the first down, but he kept it. Mm-hmm. And if the receiver makes the block, he goes for he he could have gone to the house. And that's on a fourth and three, and that was him keeping it. His what I don't understand from a year ago was was he being coached not to keep it, or you know how were they calling those? Were those just handles? I mean, it was constantly like was it an inability of him to want to run the ball or was yeah. he being told not to and, and you know that's the that's the eternal question sometimes for those guys here's a question for you if the offensive line play is just average would it be better to have a quarterback back there that's better about getting the ball out quickly or a quarterback that's better at running the ball well, like what? Because because a guy who can run the ball can still do his own read stuff and yeah. become part of the running action. It might open up some. It, it's two. Game. It's two things. You're asking me. I'm always going to say I'd rather have the feet. I'd rather have a guy okay. that can beat you with his legs. That's okay. consistent. To me, it's not about getting the ball out quickly as as in, as it is about being accurate. Because we've had well, quarter, I'm saying we've that, had court. But I'm saying one of the same. I'm saying if he's yeah. getting out quickly. I'm saying because he's going to the right spot and, and he's but actually it's... throwing a catchable ball and everything. Yes. But I mean. It, you ask pass the damn guy and you ask run the damn guy that same question. And the reality is you could probably have success in both. If, the, if a guy can get the ball out quickly and he's accurate and he's throwing to big guys like Fedoni and, and Eric Gilbert and, and Billy Kemp and, and we've got, you know, we've got, we've got playmakers out there. I'm sure we can have a lot of success yeah, with I that too. Kind of my, my thing is the, it's the consistency of the run game. When you marry that with the fact that Osborne used to say in the big eight days, that we need a strong run game because we're going to play three or four climactic games sure. here in the Big Eight. Well, we just went from the Big Eight where we're playing in Oklahoma and Texas and the, you know uh-huh. or the you know Oklahoma. We're playing South. Uh-huh. We just went to a conference where if climate's an issue, climate's going to be a bigger issue in the Big Ten than it was in the Big Eight. Yeah. I, I remember going to a game in sure. in 2014 at Michigan State uh, uh, last year, Pliny, I think it was. And we went there in early August, October. It was my dad's birthday, so the next day. So I think it was October 4th. October 4th in, in East Lansing, and it was freaking freezing. And if you would go back to the Big 8 days, October 4th in Stillwater, you could, it could be 95 degrees. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, That's true. so weather-wise plays a role in this. And I, If you could go to UCLA, it might be decent. Well, true. And I've had issues with that in the past. Like, that was one of my biggest issues the first year of Riley. 2015 was the amount of times if we threw the ball 40 plus times in a game, we lost. Yeah. I mean, it was almost the the easiest indicator of success was uh, how many times we, we wanted to throw the ball up in the air. So it'd be, it'd be interesting to see when those teams have to come, have to come East in the winter. Mm-hmm. You know, like they're biting off a lot. Oh I, my gosh. I, I, it, it'll I be not stress. Like it, it will be fun to watch USC play at, at, in Lincoln or at Michigan or Wisconsin or whatever. I, there. Just, I think this is a good point here, uh, PJ. Casey made the best of a horrible situation. I 100% agree probably there. Probably did. And, and that's, that's the thing. Why I, I, I think that, he was, for me, that's why I won't rule Casey out just yet. I mean, I love the flashy new toy of Sims big time. And if he's better, great. Sure. But but Casey's battle tested a little bit as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, we've got four guys. Granted, not as battle tested, but we have four guys that have starting P5 quarterback experience, which is nuts. Yes, Purdy right. started one at yeah. Florida State, and, and Smothers started the one against Iowa. But still, they started at a P5 level. Yeah. And then you have guys that have legit long-term experience, Sims and, and uh, Thompson. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, uh, Hayek, can we get someone like Tommy Armstrong Jr. again? He had the legs, but he also sling the ball when needed. Um, I think Tommy would probably be – I always thought Tommy would be really good in Frost offense. He probably would have been really good. But 
but nothing ever worked with Frost. Well, nothing was nothing was consistent with that offense. From game to game, it felt like different and, game plans and, and all I that. I will and never – I will not – I also – for the record, we'll always say he never caught a break. Everything that could have broke bad, broke bad. You make your own luck, whatever, but I'm just saying, yeah. when your first game gets rained out, it's weird. It's weird. Anyway, what's another one out there? Oh, I think we went through most of them. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Keep them fired. No. <laughs> well, um, this is, I mean, look, I mean, we just went an hour and 10 and, and literally had. Uh, did we cover what, what, well, I think we covered a lot. I don't know what we all covered. I yeah. have to rewatch it to remember what we talked to flow. about. Well, it's actually supposed to totally flow. What I love about Matt's rule, and that because this is to me, this is just what when we started this whole thing, you and I used to go to you know the bar in Hickman or, or whatever the Roca Bar, and we would just sit down and literally do exactly what we just did here. And by the time we got done, we'd be sitting at a table, it was just the two of us. And by the time we got done, there was like six other people sitting somewhere around us and, yeah. and, and having a conversation with us. And that's kind of what this, what this yeah. is about. It's not as scripted as the, the red cast. I don't have a bunch of videos and stuff ready and prepped to show, but um, we, we hit right, a lot. Of stuff. It, was, it was just a, well, I'll tell you what, if, if, if you red casters out there can petition for us to get some uh, practice uh, <laughs> press passes, we can get some hell of good video up. Then we will break night. Like, just have some stuff up in the background. So, yeah, that would be we'll, we'll work on that. So, you know, it, I'm trying to think. Way up, the rule said the the numbers through one through zero. I do think that's kind of interesting with the one through zero. Yeah, think, you, you're talking. You're talking. Yeah, the single think, digit numbers. As, if like if if rule were to be here for ten years, and in ten years that was a tradition, it'd be interesting to look back through all the ones or all the twos of that period. Because yeah. he said traditionally, usually it's like a safeties take like six or something like yeah. that. And so you kind of sing through the years. Because Michigan does something kind of like that with their number one uh, wide receiver. I think that was kind of like whoever wears number one in Michigan, that wide receiver is like, that's their guy. That's the. So, I mean, it's, it's not unprecedented. So that's kind of interesting. Um, hype, there's plenty of hype around. I don't know. We'll just see how it goes. I, I, uh, a little bummed down. I can't go to the spring game, but well, yeah. You know. Well, we'll do a uh, we'll do more of these mat rules here yeah. over the off season. That they are uh, <laughs> the other fun thing about them is that we can do them anywhere. If I could turn the the camera around, I mean, we were in a garage right now, but uh, uh, but yeah, it's pretty cool that Max got a garage yeah. with the uh, the. This is how it is all the time. By the way, I didn't do anything. I mean, I might squish some stuff up top that you can't even see. Oh, also, yeah. Yeah, bring it down. Oh, yeah, dude, bring that down. This is not going to come down. He's, he's got a football helmet up there. This, uh... Can't get it up. That's honestly, <laughs> you, you really can't do it. <laughs> Ignore this. No, you're not joking. Here. Oh, you have to go. Yeah, I'll just go this way. Oh, dude, what's that? That's the, uh, yeah, that's, the cowboy hat. Yeah, that's grandpa's hat. Yeah. With this, thanks to Jim Pitts. I made it. Yeah, so Matt made this. So it turns out on the internet, you can buy decals and spray paint. And that's <laughs> all you need to make your own Husker helmet. We went with 20 in that old little patch. Oh, it came with it. Number 20. So uh, obviously Johnny Rogers, Johnny Rogers, Michael Booker. Booker's a good one. Um, early Marlon Lucky. Ah, uh, very nice. Probably Booker was one of my favorites, though. I mean, aside from obviously Johnny Rogers. Well, uh, I think this is good. Yeah, we, this, that's probably enough. I think we can end on this. Yeah. Um, we'll go to parting shots, and I don't really have one, so uh, Mac, I'll, I'll let you do it. But I, I before I, I guess I will say this. Thank you to everyone that uh, has been following along. I love the comments. Like this is a part of Matt's rule too, where I think we can have a lot of interaction with the people that uh, yeah. that are watching along. So. Thank you so much for you know, on a very last minute thing, just joining us on this little uh, little adventure. Yeah, but uh, sure. Mac, uh, you send us out of here. Uh, yeah, uh, weather's getting nicer. It's probably time to get out there. And if you're going to area your yards or power rake them, I, I would go ahead and start doing that. Maybe lay, lay down some some weed and feed, something for grub control, something smart like that. Um, yeah, I'll be doing that. I mean, hey, we haven't won any games yet, right? So the grass is <laughs> the grass is going to stay green until we start winning some games. I'll, I'll be willing to let it die. You know, early September, if we beat Minnesota. 
Hey, let's go for brown grass in September. That's that's the goal. Brown grass in <laughs> September. Well, all right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for following along. And uh, I guess until the next time, that's a that's a Matt's rule. Matt's rule. A go big Matt's rule. A go big rule, Matt. GBR. Heard at Sports Network Production.